<clears throat> Good morning. Morning, welcome back. No, no, wait a minute. That's me. <clears throat> anyway, I'm delighted. Thank you. Uh, good to see you all again. Good to be with you again. Um, for those of you who don't know, I've been away for a, m a month for, for four weeks, so I'm glad to be back. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, a special welcome to you if you're visiting with us this morning. And a uh, reminder that there's coffee and tea on in this area we call the lounge out here. You're welcome to join us uh, after the service or grab a cup of coffee before if you want. And um, my, my name, by the way, is Michael. And I'm here with uh, Keith and uh, Darren here somewhere. And we've got musicians over here and a choir back here. We're all set to go. And, and uh, I hope you'll uh, enjoy our time of worship together. Uh, we're also welcome children, of course. And we know that they're going to be a bit noisy and... That's just the way kids are. We're okay with that. If you have questions about where things are or why we do things a particular way, then uh, find somebody with a blue ribbon. They're specially designated to, to help you out with that, although probably anybody could. This flame, which is a, a way that we symbolically welcome Christ into our, into our midst, <clears throat> and remind ourselves that Jesus is the light of the world for us and for others. Thanks be to God. Please join me now in our invitation to worship. This is a responsive reading. I'll go first. A new month brings new light. Morning and evening, the darkness is receding. At all times, the light of Christ shines in the darkness. And the darkness is not Today, let us turn to the light and let the shadows fall behind us. And let's join together in our gathering prayer as we say, God of grace, you meet us at unexpected times and in surprising places. Meet us again this morning that we may glimpse the depth of your yearning for justice, kindness, and humility, and that we may be encouraged in our journey of hope and reconciliation. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 to 9. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you, you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? <clears throat> Look. You serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day to humble yourself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this <clears throat> the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the throngs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? 
When you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then let your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. Here endeth the reading. So I want to talk about this, uh, this kind of remarkable reading from Isaiah 58. But before I get to that, I want to, I want to tell you a story about the reading. And it's a story that goes back uh, quite a ways, back to the 1700s, 300 years ago, uh, in uh, Salzburg in Austria, uh, a new prince came to the uh, throne. Uh, his name was Count Leopold, Leopold Anton von Firmingen. There he is there, sitting on his throne, kind of a doer-looking old chap. Uh, he wasn't just prince uh, of the city-state of Salzburg, he was also the archbishop. That was a dual role. He was Prince Archbishop von Fermian. And he was a uh, very traditional uh, Catholic. Uh, he had no patience with this uh, newfangled Protestantism, product, you know, um, <laughs> which was 200 years old by then. Uh, and in fact, he had no, uh, no patience with reforms within the Catholic Church. He was a very hard-lying guy. And so he made life as difficult as he could for the Protestants, the Lutherans, who were uh, in his realm, hoping they would go away. And they didn't go away. So eventually, in 1731, he decreed that everybody had to become Catholic or leave. And the terms of the leaving, of the exile, were very harsh. Uh, you had to leave behind your, your, your home and your lands. Uh, whatever you had left over after that, whatever you could carry with you, you had to pay a 10% emigration tax uh, on that. Uh, and you had to leave behind all your children under the age of 12. I guess the idea was that they could be retrained in the, in the Catholic faith. Very harsh. Von Fermium was astonished when 30,000 of his subjects took him up on this deal. Uh, they became refugees, uh, victims of religious, religious persecution, and they scattered all over the place. Uh, Prince William of Prussia agreed to take 20,000 of these refugees, and he settled them on land he controlled in Lithuania. Now, on that land in Lithuania were already some Mennonites, which he moved off, which he kicked out. <laughs> So just, just so you understand, it's not just the Catholics who are behaving this way. Um, so uh, 20,000 of those 30,000 were settled in Lithuania. The other 10,000 spread around. A number of them went uh, to, with, a, with a British army officer named James Oglethorpe uh, and, and helped found a settlement in, uh, near Savannah, Georgia. Now, if the name Oglethorpe sounds familiar to you, it's because, perhaps, that it, is, it was a, an answer on Jeopardy earlier this week. <laughs> or this being Jeopardy, who was Oglethorpe was actually the question to, to an answer, I think, on, on Jeopardy earlier this week. Anyway, <laughs> James Oglethorpe in, in Georgia. Uh, a number of the refugees uh, settled in Germany, and a number of them went to Leipzig. Now, in Leipzig at that time, the head church musician, the head Lutheran church musician, was a man by the name of Johann Sebastian Bach. Yes, him. Uh, and in the spring of 1731, as these refugees were arriving, he wrote a cantata. Uh, we understand it in, in honor of their arrival. Uh, and as his text, so that's, a, that's a piece of music with words from the Bible, uh, and as his biblical text for that context, cantata, he chose Isaiah 58, which is a long way of saying that this text, which was written for people who, 2,500 years ago, for people who soon would become refugees themselves, and 300 years ago was still seen to, uh, to be, it was set to music uh, as a welcoming 
to uh, people fleeing religious persecution. And I think that given the events coming out of the United States in this past week, we can understand that this reading again has something to say to people who are on the down and out, at least. I'm probably not the first to say it, but uh, if President Trump had been standing on Plymouth Rock in 1620 when the Mayflower arrived, those pilgrims who really were refugees fleeing religious persecution in their homeland might very well have been detained and sent back. Kind of ironic. Anyway, so I want to talk about Isaiah 58, this amazing passage, but first I want to talk about camels. Camels are, uh, are very large animals. An average camel weighs as much as three grizzly bears. A large male camel weighs more than a large bull moose and looks just about as funny. Everything about a camel seems designed to retain water or to live without water. An adult camel needs a drink of water every 10 to 15 days. A drink of water, you have your eight glasses a day, you know? This is a drink of water every 10 or 15 days. In the real hot weather, maybe every 5 to 10 days. Camels can lose 25% of their body weight due to water loss. Any other mammal would suffer cardiac arrest at 12 to 14%, half that. Not only can they lose water at a rate that would kill any other mammal, they can take on water that at a rate that would kill any other mammal. Uh, and a, a male camel can drink 200 liters of water that's enough to fill an oil drum, a barrel of water in three minutes. Yeah. Their body temperature changes every day. They start in the morning with a body temperature of 34 degrees, about 93. Uh, and in the late afternoon, their bodies have heated up to 104. Uh, um, whatever that is. 40 degrees. So being warmer in the daytime means they're less likely to sweat. Their body is already heated up. Camels also have a complex of arteries and veins that, that uh, cools the blood going to their brains so their heads aren't as hot. When camels exhale, moisture from their breath is trapped in their nostrils and reabsorbed into their bodies. Camels store all of their body fat in the hump. That's what it is. It's all of their body fat in one place. Wouldn't that be great for liposuction? <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> but what it means is that they don't have any insulating body fat on the rest of their bodies, so there's nothing to hold the heat in. What else? Um, their long legs keep them far from the hot sand, another way of staying cool. Their intestines are so effective at reabsorbing water that desert dwellers can burn camel dung in their fires without waiting for it to dry, when it's still fresh. They, that's remarkable. Even more than that, the red blood cells of a camel are oval-shaped instead of round like in other animals so that they can flow more evenly through the constricted veins uh, when the animal is dehydrated. That's amazing. Everything about a camel is about reducing its need for water. They are remarkable creatures. And yet, every once in a while, even a camel needs to find an oasis. Now, the word oasis, I'm told, comes from a word meaning dwelling place, that is, a safe place, a place like home, a place to be rested and refreshed, nourished and renewed. When I read that, I was reminded of that passage in John's Gospel, where Jesus says, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. It gives me a whole new image of heaven, a place with many oases. And like a camel, we too need to find an oasis on a regular basis, a place of refuge, a place and a time to be renewed, to slow the sometimes crazy busyness of our lives, to be refreshed, to be nourished. My hope, and honestly my expectation, 
is that this hour of worship on a Sunday morning can be an oasis for us all. A weekly getaway that, that contributes significantly to, our, to the practice of spiritual renewal in our lives. So I'd like to introduce a new verb into the English language. If the noun is oasis, then the verb ought to be oase. We need to oase ourselves. We can ask, have you oased lately? <laughs> we can say that to those who are close to us, eh, go oase yourself. <laughs> okay, now let's turn to Isaiah 58. The people in this time, at this time that the story is written have been complaining about God saying, we're doing all the right religious stuff. How come good things aren't happening to us? Eh? How come we're not being rewarded for it? What's in it for us doing all this religious stuff, they're asking? They say, and this tells us everything we need to know about their attitude, they say, why humble ourselves, but you, God, do not notice. Why bother? They're very proud of how humble they are. And they're upset that God hasn't noticed. Well, let me say, we, we don't practice humility so that people can notice how humble we are. Or rather, we do, some of us, but we shouldn't. <laughs> it's not really humility if you're proud of it. Humility isn't, isn't a put-on display to be noticed. It's a genuine awareness that we are not always as great as we like to think we are. The people in Isaiah's time are interested not in living out their faith, but in being religious. God isn't a big fan of religiosity. Chris Levan, Reverend Dr. Chris Levan, who I knew in Ontario, wrote a book called God Hates Religion. God Hates Religion. That's a catchy book title. I think it overstates the case a little bit, but I know what Chris is getting at. God is not a big fan of religiosity. The people Isaiah are, was addressing are the kind of religious people who give faith a bad name. They go to church on Sunday, but you'd never know it from how they behave on Monday or any other day of the week. Except for Sunday morning, no one would ever know they claim to be a follower of Jesus. Now let me be clear about this. There's nothing wrong with religious practice. In fact, I think it's necessary. But it's not an end in itself. It's not the point. It's only useful as a foundation for the kind of faithful living that Isaiah speaks about in the rest of today's reading. Is not this the fast that I choose, God asks? To loose the bonds of injustice, to break every yoke, to feed the hungry, to shelter the homeless, to clothe the shivering, to take care of your family. Now that's not a new list. We've heard that kind of thing before, and if you read your Bible, you'll come across similar lists again and again. It's the kind of list that encouraged the people of Leipzig to take in Lutheran refugees and to welcome them in song. It's the kind of list that encouraged Canadians to welcome tens of thousands of Syrian refugees just a year ago, and for this congregation to continue our work with refugees. It's the kind of list, I hope and I believe, that will encourage our American friends to return to welcoming refugees of all faiths, of all languages, all skin colors, all nationalities. Loose the bonds of injustice, feed the hungry, shelter the homeless. Should acknowledge that the work of justice making and of compassion can be wearying. On my break, I read a book about the high rate of burnout among therapists and counselors and clergy and others in the so-called helping professions. And honestly, those are professions that tend to attract camels, those who go a long time without renewing themselves. We need, all of us, constant renewal of body and mind and spirit. As Isaiah pointed out so long ago, 
religious practice is just the foundation for the kind of faithful living that really matters. And it is the foundation that, on which that faithful living rests. Both those things. So again, I say to you this morning, renew yourselves. Be renewed. Refresh yourselves on a regular basis. Oase yourselves. You and your family and your friends and your community and your God will thank you for it. Amen. So I send you from this place. Uh, hopefully you are refreshed and renewed. But as you go, remember always to oase yourselves. Go now from this place in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with each one of you this day and evermore. Amen. Thank you.